Perfect. Good morning. Welcome to Metroplane Orlando Tismo meeting. I will call this meeting to order. Uh, my name is Shad Smith, and I'll be chairing the meeting today. Um, Mr. Sonorans is under the weather and could not make it this morning, so I am the alternate. So here I am. Um, also, Mr. Hill is in a conference, so um, Keith Kasky has graciously agreed to staff the TISMO meeting in Mr. Hill's place. So um, just as a reminder, since this meeting and all future meetings will be in person, it is important to all TISMO members to attend our meetings in person to in, or, in order for us to have a quorum. Uh, members of the public will also still be able to participate virtually, and we encourage them to do so, or they can attend here, either one. Um, so, um, there are two point public comment points in the meeting. Members of the public who want to speak need to fill out a comment card and give it to Lisa. Um, those attending virtually who want to speak will use the raise hands feature on the Zoom screen. If attending by phone, you can hit the star nine to raise your hand and request to be recognized. When you're called, your microphone will be temporarily unmuted by staff and will ask you to state your name and contact number information for the record. We also accepted comments by email and phone messages before the meeting. Any additional comments, the chair? Um, yeah, um, immediately following the adjournment of the TAC meeting, Metroplan Orlando staff will be holding a workshop on the active transportation plan and all TISMO members are encouraged to attend. Um, there will be an overview of this um, workshop presented during the TAC meeting. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Keith Kasky, who's sitting in for Eric Hill of staff to review the agenda. Okay, good morning. Um, I'd also like to welcome everybody. I don't really have too much this morning. There's no changes to the agenda. Um, as uh, the uh, chairman mentioned, uh, we have the active transportation plan uh, workshop this morning. And uh, so, at our TAC meeting, you know, usually we have the presentations first and then followed by the action items. But because of the workshop, we switched that around. We're going to go ahead and have the action items first and just get those out of the way and then have the uh, workshop overview so we can quickly finish the meeting and then, uh, you know, immediately go into the workshop. So uh, just to let you all know about that. Uh, that's really about all I have this morning. So, um, uh, with this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lisa Smith uh, for the roll call. Good morning. I'll ask all committee members to keep your microphones off until call. Please say here or present. Atkins? Here. Brock for Barden? Here. Bates? Here. Doig? Here. Brode? Here. Carson? Here. Tracy for Edie? I know she's there. El Hassar? Present. Elliot Moore? Felblinger? Friel? Jovanazzo? Here. Gordon? Hammer? Herschelman? Here. Homiani? Jameson? Here. Dredge? Kane? Krug? Here. Lim? Here. Margraf? 
McDaniel, Muhaisen. Present. Pulliam. Here. Richmond. Sanders. Here. Smith. Present. Wetzel. Here. Mr. Chair, that concludes the roll call and we do have a quorum physically present. Excellent, thank you, Lisa. Um, we will now hear public comments on the action items. We ask you to provide your name and address for the record and please hold your comments two minutes or less. If any members of the public wish to comment and are joining us virtually, please use the raise hand function and we'll be recognized or dial star nine on your phone keypad. We'll send you a prompt to unmute your mic. Do we have anyone joining us virtually who would like to make a comment? There are no hands raised on the virtual side, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kathy. Do we have any members of the public attending in person that wish to make a public comment? I have not received any, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, are, have we gotten any written comments? No, okay. Um, we have three action items today. Members making, uh, making or seconding a motion, please state your name. Um, first item on the uh, for approval is the August 26th TISNO, TISMO meeting minutes. Um, so do we have, they're in tab one of your packet. Do we have anybody who would like to make a motion? Motion to approve, El Azar. El Azar. Second, Kane. Okay, second. Um, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Um, this is a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes. So, um, next item on the agenda is appointment of officer selection subcommittee. Our next item is the appointment of officer selection subcommittee to select TISMO officers for 2023. Um, I would like to ask for one volunteer from each county and um, one city from each county, if necessary, to serve on the subcommittee. We usually have three or four people, but we definitely want one from every county. So if we have any volunteers. Orange County. Orange County. Has them, has them from Orange County. Anybody from Osceola or Seminole? Okay. Okay, Charlie. <laughs> Is there any other cities that would like to be part of it? Bet there are. Yeah, I don't see any. Nope. Okay. Um, so do we have a motion to approve the appointment of these three people to these committee? No move. Deal. <clears throat> okay. Deal. Okay. And a second. Okay, Brian Sanders, second. Um, is there any other discussion? Okay, this is a voice vote again. So all in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Passes. Um, the last one is the approval of the 2023 board committee meeting schedule. So um, it's found in tab two. And Mr. Keith Kasky is going to discuss this. And make a presentation. Yeah, I think the only thing that needs to be discussed is the date of the May meeting. Uh, right now it's scheduled for May 26th, and of course that's Memorial Day weekend. So I just wanted to open it up for discussion to see if you all wanted to keep it at that date or if you wanted to move it up a week. Anybody want to move? Motions yeah. to uh, make it for the preceding party. Okay. I have a second. Second. Who was that? Okay. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Um, this is also, or any discussion further on this? Okay. This is a voice vote. Um, so all in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Nope. So that passes. Um, we also, in number seven, Presentation is one presentation today is from Kittleson and Associates. It's a presentation on signal timing strategies for investor and safety. And I'm, hopefully I don't butcher your name too much. It's Kush Bogat, it's something like that. So hopefully you can correct me, but please make sure you unmute there when you start speaking.
Well, thank you all um, for coming here today. I wanted to give a short presentation on signal timing strategies for pedestrian safety. And um, you know, I welcome questions, comments, anything at the end. Um, while I'm presenting a lot of information, it, I think it's great to have um, their questions and, and discussion. So first, we're going to start with pedestrian vulnerability at intersections. And why does this matter for the group here today? So um, a lot of us work with signals, a lot of us work with, at intersections, and uh, we need to recognize that pedestrians are a vulnerable road user, and especially at intersections. We have um, a number of opportunities. There are a number of opportunities where uh, vehicles and pedestrians conflict. You have right turns on green, permitted left turns, right turns on red, um, and 26%, a very large portion of our pedestrian fatal and serious injury crashes here in Florida occur at intersections. Now, in central Florida, most often our pedestrian volume is lower than our vehicular volume at our intersections. But that does not mean that we need to be thinking about uh, our treatments simply from a volume perspective. We need to be thinking about what is the experience for each and every one of our pedestrians at these intersections, even if we have only five per hour. And we can always make intersections safer. And we have a number of ways to do that. And as with anything, we'll start with our goals. We have a number of multimodal friendly signal timing goals. We can manage our vehicle pedestrian conflicts. We can reduce pedestrian delay communicate delay to people walking and biking and increase accessibility. Now, not all of these are achieved through the same treatments. For example, communicating delay can be through education opportunities on uh, what pedestrians should be expecting for signal phasing. Um, how does a SPUI intersection work? Um, those can be particularly confusing uh, for a pedestrian. Increasing accessibility can be through some infrastructure improvements and changes. Uh, but managing vehicle pedestrian conflicts and reducing pedestrian delay are two that uh, can relatively easily be implemented through signal timing strategies. So there are a number of different strategies, but there are five that I'm going to talk about here today, and I'm outlining them uh, here briefly. I'll go into a little more detail in the coming slides. First of all, um, would be leading pedestrian interval. And this is a countermeasure that provides a few second head start for pedestrians before uh, the adjacent vehicular um, phase gets their green. We have flashing yellow arrow omit. This makes, protect, uh, makes left turns protected only during the uh, conflicting walk and flashing don't walk so that there isn't a uh, conflict between permissive left turning vehicles and uh, pedestrians. Rest and walk. This increases the legal time that a pedestrian is able to walk um, and extends that walk time based on the available split. And pedestrian recall. So this allows the pedestrian phase to time every cycle without actuation. Oh, and, and the, the last one is also the free operation of lower cycle lengths. So we may not have to coordinate signals all the time. And I know that's a, a kind of, a bold statement, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that means and how we can uh, achieve that. So first, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm going into a little more detail on some of these strategies. So first, the leading pedestrian interval. Like I said, it's a few second head start um, that increases the pedestrian visibility, it helps them establish themselves in the crosswalk and say to the drivers, hey, this is my space for now um, while I'm walking. Uh, you do need to stop for me. You know, stopping is the law here in Florida, not just yielding, but stopping. Now, FDOT has taken on um, a multi-year study of LPIs and observations from that study. Well, the study was um, done through microsimulation as well as field observations. And the observations found that LPIs really can be beneficial at intersections of any pedestrian volume, even two pedestrians per hour. And in some cases, it's actually really beneficial at the low pedestrian volume intersections because drivers may not be expecting the pedestrians. This is a countermeasure that can reduce our vehicle pedestrian crashes by around 12%. Now in a simulation environment, 
uh, this study for FDOT found uh, average delay increases in the peak hour of maybe three to nine seconds, but that was without adjusting any signal timings. That was simply going from no LPI to LPI. When considering implementing LPI as part of a retiming project, as part of something you're already adjusting, um, you will often find no increase in delay. And uh, both the field observations and our um, simulations found no increase in split failures. Now we have a number of examples of where LPIs have been implemented uh, in the area. On Stero 438 Silver Star Road, uh, from Kingsland Nav to Darnadale, um, in US 1792 um, in the near Winter Park Village, as well as Roslyn Avenue in downtown Orlando. Now here's a little uh, phasing diagram of what an LPI looks like. So you have, af after the completion of your southbound through movement, you have your yellow and all red period for the southbound through. And then um, as the westbound uh, through normally would begin, instead you have that few second LPI where the westbound pedestrians are um, able to start walking. And that, that's that few second head start before the westbound through vehicles get the green. So that's the basic phasing of how that would work. Um, there are a number of resources on figuring out how to program leading pedestrian intervals. We have an FDOT LPI programming primer. This talks through how to program LPIs in virtually any controller that is operated in the state. And almost every controller does um, support LPI. Now it's not usually called LPI in the controller, sometimes it's called advanced walk or other things, but every controller uh, has this ability. And this document details how to program it. We also have the FDOT traffic engineering manual, which details um, a number of signal timing treatments for pedestrians, including LPI. And I will note that next week, a significant revision is going to be published related to this. And the MUTCD uh, also has guidance on leading pedestrian intervals. So there are a lot of uh, resources, a lot of different um, places you can go to figure out where should you be implementing LPI, what kind of considerations should you be uh, looking at um, as it relates to, let's say, left turn phasing um, or rest and walk and recall or, and LPI, you know, those different kinds of combinations. There's a lot of information out there. Now, a little taste of what's um, in this TEM um, revision that I'm talking about for signal timing applications for pedestrian movement. So all new signalized intersections as well as existing intersections um, must be reviewed for LPI implementation. And like I said, there are considerations for where LPIs are appropriate in there. Um, so as well as implementation considerations, like I said, that left turn phasing, when you have a protected left turn, where should that LPI go? And should it be before the left turn after and so on? And uh, then as I move on to another countermeasure, we talk about uh, flashing yellow arrow OMET. This one is about managing our left turn conflicts. So LPI was about managing our right turn conflicts, particularly right turn on red. Now uh, flashing yellow arrow OMET is about the managing left turn conflicts. And for those who don't know, um, a flashing yellow arrow is a four section signal head that um, is a proven safer alternative to five section signal heads for protective permissive uh, phasing. So FYA OMIT, um, it inhibits the permissive flashing yellow arrow during a conflicting walk and don't walk interval. Then after those uh, periods have ended, those intervals have ended, the flashing yellow arrow comes back. So you still, you still end up having protected and permissive movements. You're just now uh, adding an extra layer, layer of protection for the pedestrians. Here's a, a little diagram of what this one looks like. It's a little bit more complicated than um, with the LPI, but after the end of your southbound through movement, you're yellow and all red, and then you have your eastbound and westbound left turn movements. They get their protected green um, and then after that, you would normally see that flashing yellow arrow for them and that permissive movement 
um, during the time that eastbound and westbound through are green. However, instead, what you're going to see is um, when the eastbound and westbound through are green, um, the eastbound and westbound pedestrians get their walk and flashing don't walk. And during that time, the eastbound and westbound lefts are, uh, have a red arrow. After the completion of that time, you get the flashing yellow arrow and then the yellow and all red. Now the TEM also has information on this as well. Um, for example, uh, where should you be considering flashing yellow arrows? Um, and it notes that where the volume of pedestrians uh, may already be inhibiting some of the, your permissive left turns from occurring. So this is one for a little bit higher volume, uh, but not necessarily the highest. You can implement it at kind of medium pedestrian volume intersections. Um, so an example could be um, at a school during the arrival and dismissal periods when the, the volume of those pedestrians is so high that there's just going to be a lot of conflicts with those permissive lefts. An event venue, if you're doing um, signal timing plans for um, these special events. Now, it's not recommended to use rest and walk with flashing yellow arrow omit, because if you use if you do the two of those together, then you have a completely protected left turn. And so you'd end up with no permissive. Um, just a, a little note there. But again, there are plenty of other notes and uh, information in the TEM. These are just some of the, the big ones. Now, the FDOT research study that looked at LPI has also looked at flashing yellow arrow omit and found this one does produce slightly longer delays, about four to 10 seconds. Um, <clears throat> and you do start to get some split failures. About one to 9% of your cycles do have split failures. And for those who aren't aware, a split failure is essentially where um, all the vehicles, you're, you're not able to serve that the demand that was there on the green. Um, so you do start to see not being able to serve everyone, but when you think about what the application of this is, this is during those really high pedestrian volume times, like I said, of the school arrival or dismissal period. And so it may be worthwhile to have queues build for a little bit during that time to, to keep the pedestrians a little bit safer. And there are a number of, of examples and many of them have actually implemented in uh, the Tampa uh, area and St. Petersburg. Uh, so these ones are over in US 41, um, Steroid 60 in Hercules, that intersection actually has a high school there, um, and all US 19 and 66. There are additional treatments, uh, like I said uh, early on, that we can use for pedestrian safety. So we can, uh, and reducing delay. So rest and walk um, is easily implemented on the major road. So what this is, is that instead of giving a standard seven second walk, um, we can extend the walk as long as the, the timing plans allow. So if we had 60 seconds uh, of green time um, and we and let's say the flash and don't walk is 20 seconds, the walk can now be 40 seconds instead of only seven. Um, so now we can have a walk of 40, a flash and don't walk of 20. So it, it kind of matches to the extent of uh, the associated green phase. So like I said, it can be implemented very easily on our major roads where we often have uh, during our AM and PM peak periods over a hundred seconds of green time. And so we can, instead of giving the pedestrian seven seconds, we can give them a lot more time. Um, now on the minor roads, if you're not already accounting for that time in your timing plans, you're not already accounting for a pedestrian to be crossing, then you may not be able to implement this. But if you have more time allocated to your minor roads, then the amount of time it would take uh, for the walk and flashing don't walk, it can be easily implemented as well and does not change anything for vehicular operations at all. Pedestrian recall. Instead of having to press the button every single time, um, you could have um, a pedestrian phase on recall. So for your major road phases where your vehicular phases are already on recall, you could might as well you know, just put your pedestrian phases on recall as well. Uh, where you have enough time, again, already in your timing plan, so it's not affecting anything with the vehicles. Um, and if you are using LPIs, in fact, using pedestrian recall is very helpful because um, then you, you have a consistent uh, re 
return to green every time instead of um, particularly in a long coordinated system, um, instead of kind of changing that offset just one time when someone presses the button, you have an LPI, now you, uh, you're expecting that LPI to be part of your timing plan every time. And this, like I said, can reduce the vehicular delay incurred by LPIs in a coordinated system. Next, um, free operation at critical intersections. A lot of the time when we are doing signal timing, we and we're looking at these corridors or complex networks, we run the, we choose the cycle length based off of the most complex intersection, the most critical intersection in the network. And um, that may not always be the best uh, approach. You know, if the rest of the network, the rest of the corridor could run at 140 second cycle length, but one intersection requires 160, we don't need to run the whole system at 160. We could run um, that one critical intersection as in free operation, uncoordinated and um, separate the zones into kind of, separate the, the network into two zones around that intersection. This lower cycle lengths always reduce the pedestrian delay. And in some cases it may even reduce your vehicular delay um, if you aren't holding the entire network up to a higher cycle length. Now, lastly, we have kind of no turn on red. Now this is not entirely a signal timing treatment because this is, something that requires the infrastructure of a sign. Um, so this requires a little bit of uh, extra coordination, whether you're putting in a static sign or a blank out sign, but no turn on red is also another uh, treatment that can be used to reduce um, pedestrian uh, vehicle conflicts. So I went through a lot of information there, but I want us to, to think about what this all means. In conclusion, we have a number of goals when we are retiming. We have a number of goals when we are managing systems and we are um, actively monitoring. We want to increase our mobility, increase safety, reduce travel times, and reduce emissions. But what is the priority? You can always have a lot of goals, but you need to have a priority. Our priority must be safety. Absolutely, it is always supposed to be the most important goal in everything we do. And that does mean going beyond the minimum standards and guidance for clearance intervals and ADA. It means thinking about how can we make this safer every time we do anything. We have a large toolbox here, uh, and this is just a small, you know, small section of a small number of items that I talked about. And Metro Plan Orlando is looking uh, to work with agencies to advance these treatments and to incorporate safety and pedestrian considerations as well as bicycle considerations and in, in everything. And that's uh, the end of what I have. Any questions? Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Go ahead, Hassan. Thank you for the presentation. That, that uh, LPIs and, and uh, those other treatments can have a positive impact on, on safety, and, and that's true for the most part. Uh, but uh, has there been any local studies to confirm that? Uh, I'm talking from, from my experience on, on uh, 438, which is one of the corridors you mentioned. That was one of the, one of the first implementations for LPIs more than five years ago. And uh, when, when that was implemented, the cycle was increased from 180 to 190, which incre increases delays for everybody. I personally witnessed school buses not yielding to pedestrians at that intersection because it's so congested mm -hmm. and, 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 and uh, increasing delay makes drivers more uh, aggressive. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm curious to, to find out if there's been any local studies to confirm uh, those national studies uh, about safety benefits. Yes, the um, FDOT study also looked at safety benefits. Uh, one thing that, to keep in mind is, as with, um, as with any sort of intersection analysis and, and operational analysis, we can get precise results based off of equations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to experience that delay 
uh, at that location. Those are kind of average equations developed based on research. And that's the same thing with um, our safety benefits, that uh, there are locations that experienced actually a greater reduction than 12%, and there are locations that did not experience that reduction of 12%. But um, the local studies that were done in several districts and in context classes and looking at two-lane roadways, six-lane roadways, um, found that there was roughly that, uh, it was in that 10 to 12% range of for that vehicle pedestrian reduction, uh, crash reduction. And we also found that you don't have to increase the cycle length when you implement LPIs. Um, it can uh, easily be incorporated into your existing cycle length. And when retiming, the, um, most often LPIs were implemented as part of a retiming project. And when retiming, those benefits of the retiming project are still there. You are still getting reductions in delay um, as you go from your before to after, even when you're implementing some of these treatments. Telling you from experience on one of those corridors that you mentioned that yeah. this is not true. The, the, the delay has increased and, and, and the cycle has increased and there was no yield to pedestrians from my observations. I understand. Okay. Any is there anyone else has any questions? I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is the LPI supposed to, the one you mentioned, supposed to work hand in hand with pedestrian detection? or is it independent of it? So you can do it either way. You can implement LPIs uh, with pedestrian recall um, where you don't have to push the pad button or you can implement them with uh, um, actuation where they have to push it. Um, so it, it can be done either way. And will the delay change if they have to do it, the actuated? When, if you do it uh, actuated, the, and you're in a coordinated system, you do run the risk of, you're kind of changing the offset of that one intersection that one time, versus if you do it under recall, you are kind of planning that that will always be there. Yeah. All right, thanks. Anyone else have any questions? Just gonna, uh, offer, okay. first of all, thanks uh, for, for a great presentation. Um, you know, just a couple of more considerations of, you know, things that that um, agencies have at their disposal to do, um, you know, exclusive pedestrian operations, you know, sometimes that's done um, by time of day adjacent to schools. Um, you know, sometimes we look at that when you have school crossing guards and it's just at certain times of the day, just easier to stop all traffic and, and let for you know, half an hour or, or so uh, of a of a time period to let that operate in exclusive uh, pet operations. And then the other thing is, you know, sometimes um, the walking speed assumption, uh, you know, in downtown Orlando, south of downtown, we have a cluster of senior facilities there, you know, so sometimes the um, we look at the assum assumption of walking speed being slower in certain areas than other areas. That's a good point. Thank you, Kate. Uh, anything, anyone else? No. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Zero information. There's a number of paths, zero information from various paths. Interesting, good ones in there. Um, I just want to mention that there is links as a press release for um, their, um, what was it, their plan, which is good. You should take a look at uh, the bicycle pedestrian update, the Western Beltway widening, and um, the District 5 safety newsletter, which is always good. And of course, the normal things are still in there. So please take a look at those. Um, and I wanna remind everybody too, that the um, next meeting, it will be November 9th at 9 a.m. And um, it will be held. No, wait a minute. That's the Orlando board meeting. Sorry, I read it wrong. Um, the Orlando board meeting is tomorrow night. And the next TISMO meeting is December 2nd um, at 8.30 a.m. Um, also, as a reminder, the active transportation workshop after the TAC meeting um, should be around 11. Um, so now I'll see if there's anyone else in here who has any member comments that they'd like to make. Anyone? Nope, there's no comments. So um, this is this chance for 
public comments again. If any members of the public wish to comment, please use your raise hands feature and you'll be recognized. Style star nine on your phone keypad. Um, is there anyone? There are no hands raised on the virtual side, Mr. Okay. Chair. Very good, thank you. And Lisa hasn't gotten any more. Okay, great. Um, and I know there's no written. So um, I guess that is it. There's no other items, so our meeting is adjourned.